Uh, you filming? Yep. How are you? Had a good break? No? Me neither. Too short, as usual. I need to ask you a favor. I will have to probably scream the entire lecture because this is not the camcorder we usually use. I forgot it at home with the microphone. So we tested this in the lab. This distance should be okay, but um, I don't know. I'll do my best. This is. I don't want to scream more than this. So, uh, yeah, that would be that funny. Um, so you have the homework too. You basically have five, six days to do it at this point. It's four. Today, well, whatever is left from today and then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I really hope you realize that you don't have to do almost anything new. You just have to watch the lectures where I did the ground track and uh, an astrogator and they're just the numbers that are changing or the propagator that you use in astrogator. There's a few things that you need to change, but the rest is on video. Okay, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't make it harder than it should be, really. Uh, it shouldn't be, it may take time just because it's a few you know, points that you have to code and make sure that the plot pops up and all that stuff. But, uh, make sure that you're turning your files. So we hit run and they run, okay? I, I made it clear at the beginning of the homework. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Uh, we start something new. Be careful not to talk to the board. Which is orbital perturbations. Perturbations. Okay. Now, uh, this is chapter 12, I believe, in the newest version of the book. And I think I saved it as a PDF, and it's among your files in Canvas. I should have done that right at the beginning. Let me know if it's not the case. The paper copy that the library has, if any one of you is using that, um, unless they have a newer version, I don't think it even has a chapter on perturbations. Uh, but you do have it in PDF. And again, if it's not on Canvas, let me know. Now, in uh, the most of usual astrodynamics classes that I've seen, uh, senior classes, this is not even a topic. That's why that book originally didn't have it. Um, so I'm not claiming here that we're the best, we're doing more than others, but that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and in my opinion, if we don't finish the dynamics the right way, this is astrodynamics. This is not astro orbital determination. We need to finish the dynamics. And if we don't pay a little bit of attention to what is actually happening, if we ignore drag, if we ignore the shape of the planet, if you ignore solar radiation pressure, if you ignore the moon, if you ignore the sun, if you ignore all these things that are actually happening in real life, you're doing Keplerian dynamics. So we could basically stop here and just go home, uh, which you would probably like, uh, but that is not enough, in my opinion. So we're finishing the dynamics part. That's why we don't, we don't do uh, orbital determination, for example, which is usually done in advanced astrodynamics. I think at the graduate level we do it. Uh, but that's, that's navigation. It's using data to extract information. That's beyond dynamics. It's using the dynamics that you learn. Okay? So that's why I insist in doing this, even though in some cases maybe a little convoluted in the math, and I'll try to make it as simple as possible, but we need to be aware of, this, uh, of these perturbations. So the bottom line is that we stopped before the break with this acceleration. Okay, where the planet, assuming that that's the mu of the Earth, for example, it's a perfect sphere, the mass is uniformly distributed inside the sphere, everything is great. Uh, you, you do have some code that includes more effects here, but we haven't derived those. We will, not today. Uh, we'll start with drive today. Uh, but in general, uh, what happens is that there is more. So let's call this uh, P for the perturbation. There are more accelerations acting on your spacecraft other than just this perfect spherical planet. Okay? So it's a matter of modeling because that's what we do in dynamics. We try to you know, grab reality and bring it down to some equations we can handle. Uh, it's a matter of modeling all these different effects. And so uh, let's just uh, give some examples. So today will be very few equations and just mostly discussion. And we'll start again from drag, which is what, you know, what we see first going up. Uh, what are the things that uh, you, you get uh, for perturbations? Well, the first one that you've seen at least in MATLAB is non-spherical planet in general, but you know, 
let's leave it at our planet, the shape of the attracting body makes you behave differently from these. So this is what we call basically the Keplerian, if you want, dynamics, right, so far. This is what allows you to have that nice orbit that never changes in time and design impulsive maneuvers and go to the next nice orbit that never changes in time. That is not true. But that's the start. Uh, now we're going here. No spherical Earth. Uh, of course, drag. I mentioned that. Atmospheric drag, which is what we'll discuss today in low Earth orbit. It's a big deal. International Space Station has to uh, boost every once in a while, otherwise it's going to just burn to the atmosphere relatively quickly. Uh, what else? Well, moon or sun, as you go higher outside of the atmosphere where this vanishes, it goes away, mm -hmm. uh, the moon is there, it's, it's pretty big. And the sun is, is definitely big, despite the distance. Geostationary satellites, which is what Patrick is working on, has been working for a while, um, they have to also maneuver every couple of weeks to remain exactly at the longitude where they need to be because the non-spherical Earth, but especially the attraction from the Moon and the Sun, which is continuously changing, as you can imagine, the Moon is going around, the Earth is going around the Sun, keeps pushing these satellites outside of the longitudinal slot that they are assigned, plus they, they push them out of the plane, they start oscillating, and they're not staying in the equatorial plane naturally, and you have to fix that, otherwise you don't have the TV anymore, right? You don't see the satellite anymore. So those become important at certain altitudes. Um, Solar radiation pressure, which I'm going just going to call SRP, and I'll ask Patrick if we have time to maybe give a lecture on that because he's using it for his research. This is what you get on uh, a reflective surface of some kind because photons from the sun reflect on that surface. And if the surface is pretty big compared to the mass of the spacecraft, over time there is a linear momentum transfer. It's having a push from the sun that is very slow but eventually can create a change in trajectory. Um, yes? Is that what solar sails are? Solar sails are for that. So Patrick has been studying control algorithms for the use of solar sails to maybe maintain geostationary satellites in their slots or maybe remove them once they're done. Um, after 10, 15 years, they're done with their mission. They have no more fuel. They have to be pushed up to the graveyard orbit. That's what it's called, 300 kilometers above. And he's doing it with just this force. And again, he will talk about that. This is a force that it's only pushing you away from the sun. It's very difficult to, to manage. Uh, it's very constrained, but it's there. And uh, people have used this, if I'm not mistaken, um, on geosats for controlling the orientation of the spacecraft. So we're not doing attitude here, but that's another problem with satellites. You have to maneuver their orientation to point in the right direction. With differential uh, rotations of solar panels, people have been maintaining attitude of satellites um, by just using this. It's very slow, but it's effective. It can be used. Uh, which one? Do you want to list something else? Not really. These are all from nature, right? You don't get to change the shape of the planet. You don't get to remove the atmosphere, otherwise we'll die. You don't remove the moon and the sun, otherwise we'll die. This is there. It's part of the sun. Uh, which one do we create? There is a perturbation that makes you behave different from these. We've done a few of them. Thrust. Thrust. Maneuvers. Right? A maneuver is something you create and goes here, in this P. Right? That's the one we try to control. The perturbation, the one perturbation that we try to control these other ones, we can kind of use them. Uh, we have seen in simulation how being the right uh, in the right orbit, uh, the oblateness of the planet can be used for sun synchronous, remember when we discussed that? The planet, the, the plane of the orbit rotates and faces the sun. Uh, drag can be used, we use it in my research group for formation maneuvers. We imagine satellites that can change their crosswind surface area. And so if one has more, more drag than the other and it's going to a lower orbit, which is faster, smaller semi-major axis, it's higher velocity. Um, and so you can play with these surfaces to maneuver satellites with respect to each other. We will do spacecraft routing motion, so maybe we'll discuss that. So, to some extent, all these perturbations that sounds like a bad thing can also be used. Uh, but, for, but for the majority of things, they have to be compensated for. Okay, so let's um, 
let's have an idea about <coughs> what uh, what we see. For example, I have here some numbers at a thousand kilometers. So let's say that I get the magnitude of this acceleration, okay? And the magnitude of that is obviously mu over r squared. So it changes depending on your altitude, okay? And we call it uh, just a zero, the nominal acceleration that you get from not having perturbations. At uh, the altitude of 1,000 kilometers, this is just above the atmosphere. At that point, you really have no more atmosphere. Uh, the of lateness. So let's just list some effects. Uh, let's call this P J two. It will be clear next lecture why this is called J two. But the uh, perturbation that is due to the fact that you take this sphere that is applying, you squeeze at the poles. So taking only that into consideration is about two orders of magnitude a zero. Ten to the minus two a zero. So it is smaller than what you get from Keplerian acceleration. But that's a thousand kilometers. As you go higher, this actually goes down. You you look at the planet from far away, and it becomes more and more a point where the shape doesn't matter anymore. It still matters at geostationary heights, but less at lower point. But the ISS is, uh, and this is of course altitude. Of course, it couldn't be anything else, but just in case, ISS is at what? 400 kilometers. J2 is definitely felt at that altitude. It's continuously affecting the motion. Okay. So there is no Kepler anymore. Uh, the moon, the sun, moon and sun combined. So let's call this P, M, S. Uh, I have here, it's a lot less. 10 to the minus 7, A0. Okay. So as long as you are in atmosphere, in low Earth orbit, you basically don't even care about this. It's way too small compared to everything else that is going on, definitely compared to drive. Um, but as you go higher, you're getting closer to the moon, and it becomes a problem. If you want to be made a, in an ideal Keplerian orbit, by that I mean, I keep insisting with the gestation of the satellite, but that's the perfect example. If this is your planet Earth, and this is your gestationary orbit, which is, as you may recall, at about 36000 kilometers above the surface, something like that. Well, you're here in Gainesville, whatever your longitude is, and uh, you have your geosat here, right? Um, ideal orbit is that it's remaining always on top of you. But these two don't agree with that. So well, they will create a continuous motion that actually is an oscillation that increases with time, and if you don't do anything, you end up not seeing the satellite anymore. That's a big problem, actually, when geostationary satellites, um, for some reason, stop thrusting, I don't know, a thruster can break. Uh, the maneuvers have been poorly planned, and uh, the fuel is finished. No more fuel. They start drifting away. They become basically a, a piece of junk that goes to the geo belt, and everybody else has to move out of the way, and that has happened. Not just once, it does happen. So, um, you know, space debris is a problem. Uh, what else do we have? SRP, uh, just put it here. The effect of SRP, now this is spacecraft dependent, so it really depends on how big of a surface you have and how small the mass of your satellite is, so it's not an absolute value. These are, uh, but this, for a typical satellite, um, it's still in the order of 10 to the minus 9. So definitely, in Leo, you really forget about this too. You definitely care about lateness, and uh, I don't have even a number for drag, because drag is, uh, is really spacecraft dependent. If you have a satellite which is 10 kilograms with a 100 meter square surface, it's going to last two days in orbit. It's just coming down like a stone because of the drag that it's experiencing. ISS is a lot bigger, I don't remember how many tons, it's on that link that I shared with you about the orbital parameters, I think they have the mass there. It's updated as well. The surface is big as well, it's like a football field, right? Or three football, how many football fields is it? One, I believe, or so. But uh, the ratio is still reasonable so that they don't have to continuously fire a thruster to keep it up, but 
they have to every once in a while. So um, what do we do with perturbations? How do we deal with them? Well, we, we do this. We talk, not today, but I want to introduce them. We talk about osculating orbital parameters. Because they are, the orbital parameters, as we said, are a great way to define the shape, the size, and the orientation of your orbit, much better than position and velocity. In Cartesian coordinates. Uh, well, the effect of an orbital perturbation is the following. If you have, as you recall, a Keplerian orbit, it doesn't matter where you are on your orbit, you take position and velocity of your satellite, you convert it into A, E, I, big omega, little omega, and theta. And we said, other than this, that's basically your position on the track. These five never change, right? And they are a great way to define, with these three angles, how the orbit is oriented. Same major axis give you, gives you the, the size, and the eccentricity is the shape, and theta is telling you where the point is on that track. And that track is fixed in ECI, OK? So let's just say these are constant in ECI. Now, if you have perturbations, At any point of the orbit, you get Rv, and if you want to convert them, as we have seen, uh, it's a different story. These, these guys here are not constant. So if you operate at each time step, every minute, every 10 minutes, how often as you want, the conversion, take my current position and my velocity. I do the operations that we have seen in the past, and I convert them into the six orbital parameters, if I have perturbations, right now I'm going to see a set of A, E, I, big omega, little omega in 10 minutes or an hour, depending on where you are, you're going to see a new set of orbital parameters. They have changed. But still, looking at how they evolve is a lot more visual than looking at R and V. The eccentricity when you have drag of a satellite is going down with time. The same major axis is going down with time. That's something we can visualizing a plot. If you were to plot R, X, Y, Z, X dot, Y dot, Z dot, that would be very difficult to see. Um, and so these ones, these orbital parameters that are changing are what we call the oscillating orbital elements. They are basically your current orbital element. If you were to imagine that at this particular moment in time, you remove all the perturbations, P disappears, we become Keplerian all of a sudden. So those are the corresponding orbital parameters from that point on. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So the next, the next time step, whatever that is, you have to compute them again. Uh, except we don't have to really do that, because as we will derive uh, at some point, there are some equations that tell you, differential equations, that tell you how those parameters change depending on the perturbation they have. We'll get there. Not today. But uh, it's important to understand that the effect of perturbations we still are going to represent it with the same tools that we have used so far, which is orbital parameters, for the most part. Uh, they are called osculating uh, because that comes from um, the word, the Latin word of osculum, osculum, that should be the pronunciation, which means kiss. Because uh, what you're basically doing is, uh, I hope I can draw this correctly uh, and make some sense, but. Uh, if you are at some point on your orbit, certain instant in time, and you compute the orbital parameters, you and you imagine that they never change, you get some ideal Keplerian orbit, right? So this will be the, the ideal Keplerian orbit. But in reality, from this point on, there are perturbations, so maybe your orbit is going to do something else. Maybe it's actually not even closing ever. It's spiraling up because you are firing a thruster that incrementally pushes you away from the planet. I don't know. But what is happening here is at this position here, where you have computed the orbital parameters, definitely the velocities on the two orbits are the same. In other words, the osculating, this one, this one inside, the osculating trajectory and the real one are tangent at every single time that you compute that conversion. Make sense? 
So that's why it's called escalating, because these trajectories kiss each other. They're just they're on top of each other at that time, but then they don't, and you have to do it again. Uh, but that's what we do to represent what the perturbations are doing to your orbit, to your ideal Keplerian orbit that unfortunately it doesn't exist anymore because you have this. Okay. Um, drag. Let's talk about drag. It's the first one you see together with the obliqueness of the planet that, that will come next time. So, uh, let's be complete here, atmospheric drag. So in other words, my P is uh, some acceleration due to drag, let's just call it AD. So a little bit of information that I want to give you before we actually look at a uh, plot and maybe even MATLAB code that I have, where the ISS is going through some drag. At least that's why I called it ISS with drive. Um, <coughs> we usually say, as I told you there, that at this point there's no more atmosphere. Usually up to six, seven hundred, maybe eight hundred kilometers, you can still experience a little bit of, of resistance. With the fact that there is an atmosphere. The difference uh, with an aircraft drive is, is basically the models that people use. If, you, if your satellite is just a panel, just as an example, right? it's flying through the atmosphere and the particles are coming this way. Um, you, you're flying to almost vacuum, it's rarefied gases. The models that people use are not continuum models. It's nothing like this. There is nothing that goes behind, awake, people don't do that. That is not what happens. These particles, in many of the models, they impact your surface and they just transfer the entire linear momentum to, the, to that surface. End of the story. There's basically no lift, no side forces. They do exist, but according to what people do uh, for ratified gases, they are negligible compared to the drag force. Um, so that, that's the first thing to say. Uh, the model, so what do we, what do we uh, say that the drag force is? Let's just write it here. Um, this has to be some magnitude uh, times the velocity of, this is the unit vector of the relative velocity with respect to the particle, right? Same as you do for an aircraft. It's not your absolute velocity VCI that you have to care for, it's the velocity with respect to the atmosphere. Uh, so the VREL vector is the velocity of the spacecraft the one that we've computed so far, the one that you guys get from integrating the equations of motion in ACR, minus the velocity of the atmosphere. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. But that is how drag is modeled at, uh, well, at any altitude really for an aircraft works as well. And this quantity here, the magnitude of the drag acceleration, is modeled the same way it is done for an aircraft. Uh, so we basically write the same kind of equation, V rel squared, okay? Where well, this doesn't need explanation, it's one over two. Uh, this is the density of the atmosphere, the neutral density of the atmosphere. This is CD right here is the drag coefficient uh, A is your crosswind surface area which basically in, uh, in this sketch here is the projection of this area in the direction perpendicular to the upcoming flow, okay? This will be your A. Make sense? This is my A. Right uh, what else is, well, M is the mass of the spacecraft. And uh, VREL, we define it, is how, how you're moving inside those particles. These are very ratified gases, especially, you know, about a certain article. There's really no continuum. There's just points that impact at several kilometers per second on your surfaces. Now, 
what's the big deal compared to uh, an aircraft since everything really looks the same because we're lazy and we want to model things the same way we've done for other problems well the main difference here is in the way the CD is calculated you don't have wind tunnels for spacecraft uh, for aircraft you can do all sorts of stuff you can put them in subsonic wind tunnels supersonic wind tunnels you can have your small models and move them around and you can have the nice CD versus angle of attack plots, okay? Uh, forget about doing that for aircraft, uh, for spacecraft, I'm sorry. I'm not aware of, maybe they do exist, but I don't think they do, of wind tunnels that can speed your particles up to 7 kilometers per second, which is more or less what you see at the altitude of the ISS, in a vacuum of 10 to the minus 6 tor. It's, uh, it's going to be bad if you want to do that. Maybe some electropropulsion labs, but the problem is now the size. Those tubes that they build are very tiny, so I don't know how much you can really do this. So what people do for the CD is, again, they go back to statistical models for uh, gases, how these particles move at those altitudes, and they run, I mean, this is going way too above what we want to do, but they run what is called direct simulation Monte Carlo, which is basically a bunch of simulations with the shape of your satellite to try to statistically determine the average of your CD and the sigma some kind of expected CD. So it's very difficult for spacecraft to compute the CD. The ones that we know well, like the GRACE mission that you can uh, look up, they are simple shapes usually. They are built on purpose in a certain way so that the CD can be uh, calculated on a computer in a, in a pretty good way because we don't have a real experimental way of doing that. Other than maybe taking measurements once you are up there. Uh, but you are already up there at that point. Uh, this direct simulation Monte Carlo, I'm sorry I'm giving you a lot of information, but this is stuff that we do in the lab, so it's, it's, it's fun for us. Um, the guy who invented this method was, um, I think his student is now there, he, he was at the University of Sydney in Australia. So he did it not too long ago, but he's probably still alive. So uh, this is very uh, current uh, state of the art. So, but that's, that's what we do. You should have some kind of CD, you know, the surface. If your satellite is a sphere, that's pretty simple. But if it's a complicated structure, then the surface is going to depend on the orientation of the satellite. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very difficult course to model. Now, focusing on the density, let's start from there. So the CD is something that you will be given in some way by who, by who built the spacecraft. How do we model the density? Again, this is a dynamics class. Everything we do has a mathematical model of some sort. OK. So models for, these are really models for atmosphere, not just for the density, OK? There are several of them. Um, they model the density, raw, what we care about for that force. They give you an estimate of temperature, they give you an estimate of pressure, uh, even chemical composition, uh, many pieces of information. All right, so very first one is the US standard atmosphere. We'll write an equation for that. This was developed in 1976, not too long ago, from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in collaboration with NASA and in collaboration with the Air Force. Uh, let's write what it is. Density is given as a function of height. So this is your uh, satellite position vector. It's norm minus the radius of the planet, basically. And it is some rho i that multiplies the exponential of this quantity, z minus z i over h i, where this is called the scale height and it's equal to I'll tell you what these pieces are in a second. Uh, this is natural logarithm of rho i plus one over rho i. So all these i's are just chunks of altitudes. Uh, I'll give you a function that is basically a lookup table where basically you know you start from the ground, i equals, I don't know if it's code one or zero, from that altitude to a certain height, this is rho i, 
and uh, the z is you know, whatever it is, it starts from zero up to the next one. And then once you reach uh, the next uh, range of altitudes, you switch to the next values. You basically, you basically <coughs> plug in here for rho i's and, and big h i and z i, you, you plug in uh, values coming from the lookup table. So someone uh, from data, from spacecraft basically, um, and some and some theory, some physics came up with this model in the 70s that looks like this. I think I have an image of how the density changes according to the decimal model. That is one of the simplest you can use. But this boots up, I'm gonna write R behind. It's okay. Uh, other models. Now all these things. You can, and this is the right time to do it, since at this point you're all super proficient with SDK, you even have to use it for the homework. Um, you can turn on atmospheric drag on your simulation if you want. Basically, you have to be below a thousand, otherwise it doesn't make any difference. Um, and you can choose different density models. You can choose, I'm pretty sure you can choose the standard atmosphere, the Naval Research Lab, MSISE, the MSISE is an acronym, I cannot recall what it stands for, you can find out. Um, zero, zero indicates 2000. Where is not my laptop? Yeah, because I didn't connect it, that's why. Okay. It says laptop. Okay. So this is, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, um, the plot for uh, yeah, US standard atmosphere 76. So you start at sea level, zero altitude. This of course assuming spherical or Earth, everything is super simple here. We say that space begins at about 100 kilometers. This changes, this is also spacecraft dependent. When you have satellites re-entering the atmosphere, we say that they start burning up at about 100 kilometers. Basically, from that point on, forget about communicating with the spacecraft. It's a ball of fire, and it's gone. Uh, but it depends. It depends on the spacecraft. The space shuttle started re-entry. The re-entry was defined at 120, and it usually would have turned into a ball of fire. But uh, that that was the, the stop of space or beginning of space for the space shuttle. It really depends on on your drag profile. But that's more or less the beginning of space. Uh, just to give you some perspective, as you can see at a thousand kilometers, forget about having density here, uh, it's, it's basically zero. The Sputnik, which is the very first man-made uh, spacecraft orbiting satellite, uh, at a perigee, uh, pretty low, 200 something kilometers. I think I have the numbers here, I think it lasted 18 days, is that right? I wrote it down. It didn't last very long. No, three months, three months, oh. three months. But um, it was an elliptic, not, not that much, uh, elliptic orbit where the perigee was pretty low. Now, just to understand what is going on here as you fly through the atmosphere, um, if this is your planet and your atmosphere is some, of course, not to scale, some layer around the planet where there are particles, if your orbit is like this, that goes inside the atmosphere pretty deep at perigee, um, but then most of it is outside. What is happening here? Of course, you get drag as you enter the atmosphere, you have it all the way to the exit. Uh, but as a first approximation, since we talked about maneuvers, I could force reality to be the same as I basically have a retrofire at the perigee, because the drag is slowing you down, it's opposing your motion, right? It's, it's going against the velocity. Uh, more, right? Relative velocity. Um, but you know what is happening in this portion into the atmosphere is kind of equivalent to you every time you go into the atmosphere slowing down, opposing the velocity with the thruster. And what is the effect of doing that? You remember from moment transfers when you retrofire, you're making same measure axis goes down, the eccentricity goes down. So this orbit eventually will, you know, become more and more of a circle. Or a stop here. Uh, but it will end up being entirely inside the atmosphere and then it's gone. That's what happens with, with drag. Um, and that's actually what it's done, for example, um, 
when you do flybys and uh, you've know, probably seen movies where they they exploit the atmosphere of the planet to get a change in trajectory. The gravity is one thing, but you could also have a, a, an aerobraking maneuver where you go inside the atmosphere of Mars uh, because that's what you want, and it gives you a delta V, uh, where the delta V in this case is a combination of gravitational effect flying by the planet plus some kind of retro fire due to the drag force. So people do that. For interplanetary travel, uh, first, US, and we already talked about Explorer 1. Probably not. Explorer 1, 1958, I think, is the first US satellite, was the first US satellite. Stayed up, I wrote it down, 18 years. Perigee was a lot higher. Uh, and it looked like a small rocket, really, so the drag force was not too bad. At 350 something kilometers, 58, looks less here, but no, yeah, 58. Um, and uh, first U.S. satellite in response to the Sputnik, of course. There's an interesting story about Explorer 1. They, you know the story? They, it was supposed to spin about its long axis for stabilization of the orientation. So they injected into orbit. It was supposed to continue to fly like this, with this axis continuously stabilized in inertial space. It didn't, if you read the article. The spacecraft refused to do so. It basically ended up spinning like this. And, and they had to revise the equations of motion for rigid bodies because it wasn't actually a rigid body. So in 58, we all found out something else about rotational mechanics because of that spacecraft um, that behaved in an unexpected way. So, but it lasted quite a bit uh, because of a higher uh, perigee. ISS is circular in orbit. Uh, it's at about 400 kilometers. It reboosts frequently to remain up. Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, that's really at the edge. There's very little atmosphere, but it does, um, it does come down. In 2025, they say that it will burn into the atmosphere. The space shuttle will give it a boost sometime ago, but uh, I'm not sure what the plan is uh, to keep it up or not. Web is coming, so. But it will come down if nothing is done about it. So, that's a little bit of information about drag. What else do I want to tell you? Uh, you have questions? Yes. So you said you could use drag to, uh, to maneuver pretty much, but it, yeah. how much time would that take? Ah, uh, well, it really depends. It depends. Again, if you're flying very close to Mars, the atmosphere of Mars is very thin. If you fly inside the atmosphere and you are at the very edge of the atmosphere, you get a little bit of maneuver pretty quickly. And well, I, I can't give you a time. I will have to run some calculations, but. Uh, it, it may last a few minutes. You, you're talking about low planet orbits. If it's around this planet, an orbit for the ISS is 90 minutes, uh, if, and it's inside the atmosphere. Uh, if you're using, if you're coming from far away on an hyperbolic path, we haven't done this yet, you're coming at a pretty high velocity. If you go back to one of the exercises, I had a problem where the approach velocity here on the hyperbola was 10 kilometers per second. Uh, you're not spending most of your time into the atmosphere, so you're probably just touching the atmosphere a little bit. It may last a few minutes, and then you're out on the other side, whatever that other side is. So, short. Definitely short. Yes? Is there a beginning of space on Mars? Like, would you, would you, is there not enough atmosphere to burn up? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is enough to burn up. I mean, it's all a function. The gravity is less, the planet is smaller. The, uh, Atmosphere is thinner, but the combination of the two still, you know, you still talk about re-entry or entry in that case because you haven't launched from Mars. But uh, yeah, are you, are you modeling atmosphere? Yeah, no, you're not doing for your problem. Uh, there are models from NASA that you can use about the atmosphere of Mars. Uh, comparison, I don't have it on top of my mind, but it's yeah, it's definitely a, you know, there's a lot of studies uh, from NASA about sending heavy payloads and controlling their entry into the atmosphere so that we can have equipment on the surface and that's how we send probes. <coughs> Drag was used to slow them down, definitely. Okay. Oh yeah. So my, my question is kind of along, uh, along that line. Um, so for Mars, uh, instead of using a retrograde burn mm -hmm. to uh, enter an uh, eccentricity that, that allows for, for orbit capture, you mm -hmm. can uh, aerobrake. As you, as you said earlier, is there a way to model that uh, yeah. using the drag of speci a specific location on uh, on Mars's atmosphere? Yeah, there are models. I, I, I again, I don't know the names. Uh, 
specifically, but there are equivalents of these models for the atmosphere of Mars. They are definitely less accurate because we sent a few things up here and you know, we're not continuously flying through that atmosphere, but there are models. Uh, for capture, you're coming from an interplanetary trajectory, you're coming very fast uh, to slow down more than you will have to come closer and closer to the surface. I don't know how much you can actually slow down in one pass and, and hope to enter Martian orbit you know, without you know, using a plastic part of that. Um, any other questions? Before I show you something else that still has to do with drag. So, let's, uh, oh, no, before I show you the MATLAB code, let's uh, talk about this. This is the only piece. Uh, there were more models that I want to talk about. Um, we have to write what is V atmosphere, but there are more that I want to give you just for your knowledge. I'm going to use the US standard one. Uh, because it's the simplest. Jackia Bowman is another one. These are two gentlemen who also in the 70s or so started developing models, maybe 60s, uh, of the drag at, um, of the atmosphere of this planet. This gentleman is still around. He wrote a proposal together, it didn't get funded, but he's still pretty active. He's retired, but he's still active. So this is all very recent, recent um, uh, theory that's been done. These particular models here, um, they are basically mathematical expressions, but uh, they can also take some satellite data. So every once in a while they get spacecraft data from several tens of sat uh, satellites. They have, have uh, orbital information and, uh, and they can produce what is called another model, the High Accuracy Spacecraft Drag Model or HASDAM. And that's one of those that you can, we cannot access because it's Air Force. You know, property. Um, it does basically use an existing uh, mathematical expression and they continuously update the parameters, the constants in those models from satellite data. So that's not something that is public information. Uh, in Europe, the last time we checked, there was this drag temperature model 2013 that the European Space Agency claims is a lot better than anything else. We didn't find it to be that much better. And then uh, there's also some papers on my website uh, about modeling drag of the atmosphere and predicting the drag on a given orbit. But that's you know, beyond what we want to do. Now, what is this V atmosphere that we have to model to get the drag force? How would you model the velocity of the atmosphere? What is the simplest thing you could do? Which, of course, is kind of realistic. Planet, ECI, the planet rotates with an angular velocity that's called the omega e about the z-axis, spin, day-night rotation. The first very simple uh, assumption that people make, believe it or not, is that this layer of gases that is very thin around our planet it's part of the planet itself. It becomes a rigid body of the planet. So, the very simple model that people use is rotating atmosphere. Where rotating means it's rotating the planet. Atmosphere. That's what STK uses. Then there are more elaborate models that take into account winds, as they call them, at, at Leo altitudes. There's other statistical models that try to go away from this simplification, and they're also in SDK. So I invite you to open everything that has to do with drag in SDK and look at all these options. Uh, basically, if you do that, your V atmosphere becomes omega of the planet cross wherever you are on your orbit. In other words, if I am inside the atmosphere somewhere here, uh, this is my space this is my position vector, the atmosphere there is moving together with the planet. So, the velocity in ECI that you would see there for the atmosphere is given by this cross product. Does it make sense? It's just a ball that is going around. The atmosphere becomes part of that ball. And so basically your VREL is now finally the velocity of the spacecraft. When I say this, it's the velocity that we've been computing so far in ECI minus the velocity uh, of the rotating atmosphere, which is of course another ECI-based velocity uh, for the atmosphere. 
Make sense? So if you do that, uh, and you model it, I have to open. So this is, I'm going to share this file with you. Um, I created basically an equation of motion that I integrated in ODE45 that has the G2, the G2 will derive it next time, and drag. Drag according to that model and um, for rotating atmosphere and this density lookup table. So if I go inside that, that's not the way. Uh, but basically if I go inside the function, this is what I'm doing, okay? I come in with x, y, z, v, x, v, y, v, z, as you've done so far. Uh, you say that the velocity of the atmosphere is the omega of the planet, which is a constant I have defined somewhere up there. I think you've used it before for the ground track, right? <coughs> Whatever is the duration of the day. Um, yeah, the Earth's angular velocity is this number up here. But that's a scalar, so I do omega e on the z axis of ECI. So that's why you see omega e that multiplies uh, 0, 0, 1. With the cross product of that vector in the z direction with x, y, z. So that, that is basically this operation right here. Okay? So that's the velocity of uh, the relative velocity is v that comes in from my uh, input here. Remember, u was x, y, z, x dot y dot, z dot, so the last three components were the velocity, and in fact, that's what I'm doing here, v is defined as u4, 5, and 6, and so this is my radical velocity. Uh, and then I go here, and I say, okay, if my altitude, which here is assuming a spherical planet, so altitude is basically defined as norm of r minus the uh, radius of the planet, is less than a thousand kilometers, there is drag, and so this is all old stuff, Keplerian force, this is J2, we'll model that next time, and this is your drag force. 1 over 2, can you see this? The get density function of R minus RE is that lookup table that I'm also going to give you, the model's standard atmosphere. Here it is. We don't have to do anything other than input in altitude, and this function will go to a bunch of values in kilograms over meter cubed, and then this do this final if operation here to check where you are and decide what value to use. Okay, special. And so, uh, basically this is 1 over 2. This get density is rho. CD, I do not remember what I picked. Usually for spacecraft is 2. For the majority of satellites, it's somewhere around 2. It's a tiny spacecraft of a mass of 5 kilograms with a small surface. Um, Paddles is the name of one of the CubeSats that we are uh, that we have designed in the lab. So that data is the CubeSat. We don't really care, you can change those numbers. And so you have CDE times surface over the mass uh, times um, the velocity um, vector. So I would have to do well, 1 over 2 rho s CD and uh, I call this A, right? I call this A. C, D, E over M. And I said V rel squared in the direction of V rel opposite. So that's, that's basically what that instruction is doing. It's doing V squared, but this is a vector, so it's also making it a vector. 10 to the third, because everything was in kilometers. Um, and that's it. So, uh, but I have to do this if else. Because if you input something above a thousand into that get density, it's not intelligent enough to give you a zero, if I remember correctly. There was a reason for doing this. I think it crashes. So you just have to tell it above a thousand, forget about drug, don't even don't even add that one. Uh, and so if you run these for what is it? Fifteen days, I think. So I'm running these with drug and without drug, I think. And I'm comparing what's happening to different orbital parameters. Remember when I gave you that homework to convert position x, y, z, x dot, y dot, z dot into orbital parameters? Do it in a for loop. So I'm doing it here as well. Uh, I forgot the legend. I'm sorry. Um, but, okay. This is 
where you will get with and without drive. Which one do you think is with drive? The blue. The blue. Now, the red seems like it's going up. Uh, remember that I have J2 modeled in my equations of motion, but uh, I'm not taking into account the fact that the planet is not a sphere. So I'm not modeling the height the right way. I should take into account the fact that if I am over the pole, uh, the, the radius of the planet is different than at the equator. So I'm not doing that. That's why you see this kind of weird behavior where it seems like it's gaining altitude. It's not really. It's just that I'm not modeling that. Uh, but definitely you see an effect in the altitude in just 15 days on, uh, on, on the drag, argument for AG, uh, REM, inclination, eccentricity, same major axis, it's going down. Uh, and well, this is the So I'll share this with you. We'll reopen it up next time and then move to the video.